Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Getting to Know You. Um, this week, we have a very special guest. Uh, yeah. she's, a very, she's very pretty. Uh, she's very intelligent. And um, she uh, is smarter than I am. Um, let's see. Uh, did I mention she was good looking? Uh, this week's guest is uh, Lisa Metz. Hello, Lisa. How are you? Hi, John. That was a really nice introduction. Well, thank, thank you. you. I said very little about you, but I, I talked about your aspects and qualities. <laughs> Thanks. That was kind. Um, yeah. When you I actually, the, you should say the thing you actually first noticed about me or first liked about me is hilarious. Oh yeah. Well, I, um, I think the first thing that attracted me to Lisa was her handwriting. She has very grown up professional looking handwriting and I was impressed by it. That's true, right? Is that what you're thinking of? It is what I'm thinking of. It's like every woman's dream is to um, have someone love them for their handwriting. It's really what I grew up wanting. So thanks. It, it, it came to a surprise. It was a surprise to me too. So <laughs> um, to, to, to everyone that may be watching this, um, Lisa, when I started these interviews, we, Lisa and I kind of jokingly said, oh, someday I'll interview you. Should we be in the same place or not? And um, it just kind of... I, I do think Lisa has a lot to offer and I wanted you to get to know her more. But I, in addition to that, um, we thought it would just kind of be a fun thing to do. And I happen to be at Seb's and she happens to be at home. So we are doing mm -hmm. Zoom and, and not together. Um, so, I mean, I know you pretty well. I don't need to get you to do. know you. You do, you do. Yes. But, um, but for people that may be watching this interview, tell us a little bit about you. A little bit about me. Okay. Um, well, I'm a teacher and I've been a teacher for, um, for a while at Divine Savior Holy Angels High School. I teach theology. Um, and so that takes up a lot of my time, I guess. I mean, I really, I really love my job. So that's a big part of, of, of who I am. Um, I love our family. We have two kids, uh, you and I, as you know, <laughs> we have two kids. We have a daughter, Maria, who is 12 and a son, Nate, who is 10. And so, um, yeah, I think my role, I, I just, I take seriously the like working mom role that I have. You know, I think that's uh, challenging today, especially in the midst of COVID. But um, fortunately for me, I really do uh, love my job and love being a mom. So um, yeah, that's a little bit about me. And, and, and you're very good at both those roles. Well, thank you. That's nice of you to say. Um, it's a balance of, of um, trying to do, you know, it's, it's, I feel like it's always about how do you stay involved in your kids' lives and have a career where one isn't totally overpowering and messing up the other. Um, so I, I'm just always trying to work on that balance. It's hard. Yeah, certain things get sacrificed, like my socks uh, stay on the floor, or dishes get piled up in the sink, or mm -hmm. you know, when, mm -hmm. when you're working, it's challenging. But I, I was mm -hmm. gonna, I was gonna ask you. Um, so you you teach at Divine Savior. Were you always a teacher? Did you always know you wanted to be a teacher? How did you get into teaching theology? Yeah, it's an interesting story how I got into teaching theology because no, I never, I, I kind of always actively said I didn't want to teach when I was when I was younger I really got into ministry first well my my undergraduate degree is in social work and so originally plan number one was to be a social worker and I I, I graduated with that degree and I worked for a short time at um, an adolescent treatment center called St. Rose mm. and I worked with adolescent girls it was specifically a residential home for girls age eight to 17. And I was there for about a year and a half. It was sort of a combination of my, my internship for my social work degree. And then I worked there for just a short time after I graduated. It was a really powerful position. I learned a ton. It's really where I fell in love with working in an all girls environment with the culture of adolescent girls and really what they have to offer. It was just pretty quickly clear that that wasn't quite the path for me. Um, I have always been involved in my faith and I had been involved in, in high school youth groups and college campus ministry. 
And then it became clear that I was sort of uh, feeling drawn to that from a career standpoint. I think working with young people was definitely what I always wanted to do, teenagers specifically. And I thought of this as maybe after seeing the, the struggles of the girls I was working with directly in the, in the treatment center, um, I wanted to be on a proactive end. And so I, I went into ministry. I, um, I did some training to be a parish youth minister and I had a lot of connections fortunately with, with that and was lucky enough to get a parish youth ministry job and, um, and did that and, and loved that, um, found really quickly that I wanted to know more about theology and I, cause that wasn't what my degree was in. So I went back to get a master's degree in religious studies at Cardinal Stritch. And it became clear that I wanted to do that sort of full time. I wanted to jump into that master's degree and really make that something I could, I, I, I found this love for ministry. And it, and, and it was, I was definitely using my social work degree. I mean, there was definitely some overlap there. Um, but I, I really felt the need to, to study theology more specifically. So I went to get that master's and needed to pull back from working full-time in parish ministry. And, uh, and that's what brought me to DSHA because there was a part-time job available there. And uh, who was, uh, who, who did you connect with? At the oh yeah. So our friend, our, our friend, Father Jerry Herta was the um, campus minister at DSHA for uh, a, a number of years before that. And um, Father Jerry's a good friend and, and he knew that I was going back to get my master's and was looking for something part-time. Um, and he said, hey, I could use help in campus ministry here. And so it was a ministry job. It was working with adolescent girls. It was kind of a, a cool fit. And I said, sure, Jerry, I'll come and, and do that while I'm working on my master's. Um, but I really think I'm feeling called to parish ministry. I wanna do something in, in the church on a broader level. I, I don't know that I wanna be in a school long-term. So I just want this to be temporary and I just want it to be part-time. And he's like, great, let's, let's see how it goes. So, so I started that, um, and that how, position. How long were you there? So that was, that was in 2000. So I'm in my, uh, this is my 21st school year. So that part-time temporary, job is now very full-time <laughs> and uh and yeah it definitely was not temporary i i did start in campus ministry at dsha grew to um get some uh, to teach some classes found that i really loved that and now i almost exclusively teach so um definitely i came into teaching in a unique way um, but i really do love it which it's important for me to say you do you still do some adult faith formation at DSHA, but you're also chair of the theology department at DSHA. I'm chair of the theology department, and I do um, I have the role of the coordinator of adult faith formation at DSHA. So I work with the faculty and staff, and uh, it's a really good blend of being able to still be pastorally present. So I do feel like I'm a minister still. And that was really what, what I loved. And, and again, I'm drawing from my social work undergrad um, in that work, but I, I have really found that I love the routine and the ritual of teaching and specifically teaching theology and specifically teaching theology to adolescent girls. That's just what I found. I think I've, um, I'm just right where God wants me to be. Yeah, you uh, you are are loyal and you uh, like your patterns and and you found your niche. You found a good. Yeah, place. I must. If if you yeah, we talk about the enneagram a lot in our family, and um, I'm definitely a high six on the enneagram, which is the loyalist and the defender. And I I guess I like I, I do like that routine and ritual. So maybe part of that is I like the beginning, middle and end quality of an academic year and teaching a class. I like, uh, yeah, the structure of it all, but, but most of all, I get to talk about really interesting things on a daily basis with a population of people that I just, I just love. I, I think today, um, teenage girls are just, 
um, the most interesting group of people. I, I've, it's never boring. I say that a lot, it's never boring. What, um, what do you love about teaching girls? You know, I, I think probably the, in an all girl environment, and to be fair, I never taught in a co-ed environment, so I'm not comparing it to anything. I mean, this is just what I know and love about the limited experiences I've, I've had as far as academic um, institutions. I just find that the honesty and vulnerability is really uh, present and there's an, a natural uh, nurturing that takes place in an all-girl environment. Um, and it's, it's very empowering. So I'm lucky. I'm just, I'm just lucky that I, I feel really close to the students that I get to teach. I feel like we have a common mission. Um, and they're, they're hungry for, for knowledge. They question a lot. They question a lot. And that sometimes I think to some people for teenagers today, and that's not just girls, that's, I'm sure that's true about boys as well. The questions and the doubts and the struggles that um, that young people have, particularly related to church, I find that all fascinating. I think it's totally normal. I think the most important thing we can do is provide opportunities to talk and ask questions and discuss. And um, and they're really searching for community. And if we can provide good community and we can provide good experiences of faith development, then uh, that's gonna have long lasting effects. So I think it's wonderful. Well, and I, I've, I've living with you, I've witnessed uh, the relationships that have continued past graduation. So mm -hmm. it, it, well, that is one of my great joys. I mean, I will say one of my great, great joys in this work is seeing students as they graduate become adults and now having students because I've been there for so long having students that have come back and are now my colleagues so fellow teachers with me um you know I have family members your sister my sister-in-law that was a student there when we were dating which was really fun um just seeing what that empowering environment did for her life um my, my cousin Angie was, was a sophomore when I started at DSHA and just seeing her grow through that. It's just been, it's been fun. And then, yeah, many other relationships that I've been able to keep. And, uh, and, and it's just, it makes me so happy to see the lives of, um, of these wonderful, incredible women. And I, and I think what they had in their, in their high school um, life was a community, a place where they could ask questions. And I, and I, I, I do tend to tell the, the story a lot that I don't know that I'm the best answer giver. I, I just am the best conversation um, breeder. You know what I mean? Like, I don't, I don't, I, I think I started teaching thinking I had to have really good answers. And I always will say like, students will ask a question in class and I don't have a really good immediate response to a question, but I know it's important to get an answer. And so this is what I used to do. I used to like go home, um, rifle through my grad school notes, um, search online theologians and people smarter than me that um, have that could that could formulate an answer. And I would sort of come up with some big response to a student's question. Um, that she asked that day that I didn't have a good answer to. So inevitably this, this happened a lot early on in teaching. And then I would go back to that class the next day and I would say, um, Susie, remember yesterday when you asked me X, Y, or Z, um, I, I, wanted, I wanna talk about that right now. And, and Susie would go, oh yeah. Oh yeah, I remember that question. Um, and, and I'm like, didn't you want an answer? Like she would, she would acknowledge she asked the question. She was not necessarily looking for the perfect textbook answer. She was looking for the environment in which the question could be asked. And we could, I could certainly share, here is the church's response. Here is the theological um, explanation for it. But more so, I think we young people just want a place where it's safe to ask those questions. So I, I learned early on that 
um, that creating that safe space was more important than any, anything that I knew or didn't know or, yeah. Yeah. I wanted to say, in addition to watching people get married and see them as coworkers, we've also had a fair number of Seb's um, parishioners who went through DS and then are coming to you and me for baptism preparation, which has been kind of fun. Yeah, yeah, that's really special. Yeah. That's fun. Um, also, I think this is a good place to say, um, I echo your social work skills being yeah. integral into uh, being a good minister. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a good it's a good time to note that you and I have the same background that is we both have social work undergrads mm -hmm. thinking we're going to do social work type skills mm -hmm. and we both have master's degrees from Cardinal Church University in ministry mm -hmm. we were not in school together because you're significantly older than I am. no see I knew you were going to say that I'm significantly um yeah I'm ahead of you I'm I'm beating you in the uh in the age and wisdom I'm a little older than you a little bit, a little bit, but, little but, bit. but, but when we met, it was funny because we had the same path. We just didn't match up in school. We just missed each other. Right. Right. Because, because of my, um, Advanced. ridiculous age. Yeah. Yeah. The ridiculous age gap. Um, it really only, I mean, let's be honest. It really only bothers me when it comes to some pop culture yeah. references that are like, um, things that were meaningful to me like in college like freshman year of college and i'll i'll hear something or refer to a movie or something and i'll and, say, sweet that was i love that song in middle school yeah see that's rough i don't yeah yeah <laughs> i don't like that that's that's it otherwise you are you are um you are wise i didn't quite i didn't quite match your I mean, I didn't go and get a doctorate. That was crazy. That's you did that. I'm I'm not doing that. I have no interest in that. You you went along for the ride for sure. It's like I should have a doctorate because I lived with someone getting a doctorate. Isn't that what? Isn't that a thing? I think that should I, an I, honorable. I would say you did the heavy lifting uh, for our family during those four years for sure. So, so thank you. Um, hey, uh, where I'm only on the second question. Uh, my, se my second question is, you've, you talk about ministry, you talk about, you know, the importance of creating safe spaces for people mm -hmm. to ask questions, but I'm curious if you can articulate a little bit about your own faith, and then maybe as a sub-question, how have you been engaged in St. Sebastian's okay. school and parish? Um, yeah, my own faith. I, it's strange when I, as much as I talk about, you know, giving students a chance to doubt and question and, and accompanying people. And I do love that word accompaniment yeah. through the ups and downs of faith. I can't say that I've had huge downs in that journey. I mean, I, 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 guess, I guess there's been rough patches, certainly. I, I've just been a lifelong cradle Catholic and I, I'm particularly drawn to um, the parts of the church that, are, that surround ritual and sacrament. And I love everything about the ritual and the sacramentality and the all, all of those tangible items in our church and the um, Catholic social teaching um, principles and values and, and documents. So there's enough of that. I, I don't know. I'm just really, I'm, I'm drawn to that. So I've, and that's primarily what I teach. I, I get to teach uh, Catholic social teaching uh, courses at DSHA and, and sacraments classes and I'm, I'm so lucky. So I'm, I, I guess my faith has been strong and I, maybe it's because of that loyalist side of me that like mm -hmm. desire to just kind of stick with something as evidenced by being in the same job for as long as I have been. I, I, I just think there is, there's goodness there, but that doesn't mean that I don't struggle with some of the individual um, pieces of our church, the complexities, um, scandals, and, uh, and struggles that are there. I just, I just think that being a part of a faith community is, is so wonderful. This is the faith community I was born into, and it has brought me so much. I was lucky enough to always be surrounded by women who played vital 
leadership roles in the church for me. So I, I just happened to see that I was, I was lucky enough to be a part of churches with, with good preaching and focus on young people. And so I just happened to have a really good experience with that. I know not everyone has, um, and I just honor where people are, but I'll, I, I think this is, um, this is just where I'm called to be, even in its flaws, even in its imperfection, which I'll be the first to stand up and say, this church is not perfect. Mm -hmm. um, as far as St. Sebastian, it's, you and I have been parishioners there since um, Maria was like in kindergarten. I mean, we really joined, we were really attracted to the school and that was our entryway into St. Sebastian as a faith community. And to be honest, part of that came from seeing so many students come from so many different parishes in the area. And when we were looking at schools for our daughter, I thought back to, you know, kind of the end game. Like what, what, do, I, what do I want my daughter to look like coming out of a Catholic school? And I thought about the SEBS grads that I had the pleasure of teaching at DSHA already by that time for many years. And so that, that went into our decision. Um, and then through that have been involved in um, different ministries in the, in the school. Um, and one of the things that, that has brought me a lot of joy, and you mentioned this, was doing baptism prep together that you and I have been able to work with young couples. It's just really always heartening and exciting to see um, couples come with their infant wanting to enter the church. And many of them, many of the families that are coming to have a child baptized have had their own rocky relationships with the church or left the church for a while. And, and I'd like to think we're a safe place to land and, and, and like to welcome them back with open arms. It's, it's, it's no judgment. It's not like, well, you should have been here all along or, um, see, told you you'd be back. It's, it, it's just where people are. You, um, I, I just want to echo that you really were the driving force in our family to join SEBS. And it, it was your reflecting on um, SEBS graduates that were students of yours at Divine Savior saying, this is the kind of kid that we want to raise. And so yeah, and it has so much to do with I think one of the, the missions and, and the great strength of St. Sebastian in its commitment to um, social justice, its commitment to diversity. Um, and in particular, looking at the school, like I, I just, I feel so proud of the school at St. Sebastian and um, the diversity of backgrounds and thoughts and zip code and, um, you know, just it's, it's a wonderful place and it's been wonderful for our kids to grow up with uh, that rich tapestry, you know, of, of people woven in from different socioeconomic backgrounds. It's just not like one, it's not one neighborhood or one type of family that attends. And that was really important, I think for me, for us, so, you know, we, we talked about this a lot, like raising our kids in a school uh, where we could find a community and be involved, but also really allowing our kids to be exposed to all different types of people. And we just couldn't be happier with that. And so that, uh, that was wonderful. You also, um, just, to, just to mention, you also have been very active. You've been on a faith formation committee at the school committee. You've been active in facing racism. You mentioned baptism prep. So there's a, there's a lot of different pots you have your hands. In. Yeah, it's, it's I, I guess I do all of those things sort of, um, you know, as, as good as I can, it's hard. It's like, I want to do so much yeah. with, you know, full-time teacher, full-time mom. I, I just think it takes many hands. So I can't do everything perfectly, but I love that at a place like St. Sebastian, there's so much to get involved with. And uh, it's just been a really good place for our family. And I, I grew up at, uh, my parents were so involved in our Catholic school and Catholic church. And we um, spent so much time there with my parents volunteering. It was like home to me, my school and my church community. And I think our kids feel like that as well. Like we're, we're there a lot. And, um, and I love that about SEBS and I, and I love its commitment to um, the city and, and its, its area and, and the whole community.
Yeah, and and a side note, just a little bit of our family dynamics, like it's been such a blessing for me to now be ministering at SEBS because for a long time I was, you know, having to work uh, at another parish on the weekend. Yeah. So we would often go to church at uh, different times and different places, and it's been a blessing to kind of enter that together this year. So yeah, it's true. It's true. It's really been, um, it's really been great. So. Um, my last question for you is, as you think about the future, what do you hope for? It's a broad question. I, what do I, I hope for? Purposely is. <laughs> um, it's my social work background. Yeah. I, I, I think a lot of what fills my heart and time and conversations and struggle right now is the place we are in as a church and as a country um, with racial justice. And it's one of the great gifts to me that I've had the opportunity to do at DSHA is work in um, trying to continue the conversation about racial justice and about uh, racial reconciliation and about issues of equity and diversity I um, moderate a club called Sisters of Culture and, and it provides a, a platform for um, primarily uh, black students, but really girls with, with lots of different backgrounds that wanna talk about um, racial justice. I guess, so my hope would be that we can um, both locally at, at St. Sebastian continue what I think is a really um, wonderful effort in our Facing Racism group to just confront. I think, I think the most important thing is acknowledge and confront and discuss. Can we fix everything? I think that takes time. I just, I just think confronting and discussing and allowing those hard questions to be to be asked. It's what I try to do with my students. It's, it's what we try to do with our own kids. It's hard. Every age group needs something different, but my hope is that we can find ways for true reconciliation and healing um, as we see our kids grow up in this world. You know, I, I didn't know it would be the theme of this conversation, but I will go back to our social work backgrounds because mm -hmm. I think what you do in your classroom and what you're talking about mm -hmm. is allowing mm -hmm. there to be enough space to have mm -hmm. The, uh, the safety for the questions, but then the open and honest dialogue. And I think you, you know, you, you've done that at um, DSHA, uh, you, you started a civil rights pilgrimage where you brought um, students down south and you've done good work with facing racism. And you don't say, we're here to solve the problem. Yeah. You say, we're here to learn, we're here to understand and- uh, Yeah, and to admit that we don't, that we don't know it all, that we, that we, have a lot of room to grow. Um, and, and that's hard, it's exhausting in some ways, but I'm, I think it's, it's, it's worth the exhaustion. I think that it's, um, it's one of those things that's absolutely worth our time and our, and our effort. And I'm, I'm, I'm learning constantly. I'm, um, yeah, I, I, I find that to be really important. It wasn't always something that I thought would be sort of part of the trajectory of my life, but I'd say the last five, maybe to 10 years, it's just become more vivid that, um, that this is really important. Yeah, yeah, and I think you've done a good job honoring that process and, uh, and, and the challenging subject matter. <laughs> Yeah, the, well, in the social work degree, you're right. That's interesting. I, I don't know that I, <laughs> we don't really talk about that a lot, you and I, just how, where our social work degree fits into it. I think at the, I, I, that idea that connect, making connections with people, forming community, mm -hmm. um, allowing for good discussion, those personal relationships are going to go a lot further. I think that's how I, I run my classroom too. I mean, I certainly, it's, it's an academically rigorous environment. And so there's expectations from, from that, that standpoint. But uh, I, I just think it's about relationships. I think faith development is about um, feeling drawn in to something by someone and, and then things grow from there. So 
Yeah, it, it comes into play our, our social work background. Yeah, this is where you and I are very much on the same page. I always say like as a minister, my number one first job is community builder and then everything mm -hmm. can from that. So mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I, I think um, but we don't always, uh, um, we don't always necessarily agree on every TV uh, decision we make, but we do agree. On or where our, or where our dirty socks go. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. But, but our core values are, uh, are very much match. And I, I appreciate that about you. You, yes, you're a, uh, right. Yeah, that's true. That's true. And I think we, I think we parent well together and I think um, you're a good, I like you. That's yes. good. You're very pretty. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, um, Lisa, thank you so much. It was it was an honor to have you uh, be interviewed here, and I appreciate the wisdom that you share with uh, Saints mm. and Pastors. Thanks. And what are we doing for dinner tonight? Because that is always the question that we ask right around now. It's the afternoon time. I'm, you know, we just we should probably figure out what our what our dinner plans are. Yeah. Let's uh let's hang up let's hang up on this call and then call each other back and figure that out to right? figure out dinner. Yeah, because this is. I, I did not know, I, I saw a meme that said, who knew the hardest well, decision, the hardest thing about being uh, an adult would be figuring out what's for dinner. Every, every night, <laughs> every night. Yeah. And we have to feed these two other human beings yeah. that are in our house. I'm, yeah, so, so we gotta figure that out. Okay. Um, nine out of 10 times, I'm gonna say let's order pizza. Okay, all right. It was good to talk to you, Lisa. Um, and uh, we will talk to you. Okay. Love you. Love Thanks. you too. Thanks. Bye-bye.